6640. 6640. Your future lies in 6640. 66 books by 40 authors, and yet we now discover it's an integrated message system from outside our time domain. Welcome to 6640, the ministry outreach of Koinonia House and Koinonia Institute. Today's Bible teacher is Chuck Missler, connecting the Bible to your life and the world around you. In today's study, Chuck continues his teaching on the book of Ezekiel, chapters 26 and 27. He shall slay with the sword the, thy daughters in the field. He shall make a fort against it, against thee, cast a mount against thee, and lift up thy buckler against thee. He shall set engines of war against thy walls, and with his axes he shall break down thy towers. By reason of the abundance of his horses, their dust shall cover thee. Thy walls shall shake at the noise of the horsemen, and of the wheels, and of the chariots, when he shall enter into thy gates, as men enter a city wherein is made a breach." With the hoofs of his horses shall he tread down all thy streets. He shall slay thy people by the sword, and thy strong garrisons shall go down to the ground. You know, this is pretty bizarre prophecy from a captive in Babylon talking about the then most powerful naval center known to the known world. Now, verses 7 and 11 clearly predict that Nebuchadnezzar will take the city, and the pronoun he is used in this passage. From verse 12 on, the singular he becomes they. Something else is introduced here. God said nations were coming, and that is the prediction. And they shall make a spoil of thy riches, and make a prey of thy merchandise, and they shall break down thy walls, and destroy thy pleasant houses, and they shall lay thy stones, and thy timber, and thy dust in the midst of the water. That's kind of a strange phrase. What does that mean? One of the most bizarre exploits of the ancient world was Alexander's gambit when he shows up and he builds his causeway. Years later, Alexander the Great made his attack on Tyre. And that's exactly what Alexander did. He's got this island out there that's a fort. He's got plenty of soldiers. He takes the soldiers and they literally take the rubble and the scrap and the debris, and the whatever of the old city, and move, dump it out in the water. And they build a causeway. They do that for seven months, manage all the way, and then his army, invisible as it was, captures Tyre by the causeway. That causeway is legend now in the ancient thing, the destruction of Tyre. See, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city. His, the second prophecy had not been fulfilled. Who's going to take up stones and even scrape the dust into the ocean? Strange phrase. And after the return of the tyrants from Babylon captivity, they decided to rebuild their city on the island and forget about the mainland. Since they were a seafaring power, they could better protect themselves on an island. They were a naval bunch. In 332 BC, Alexander got there, saw the ruins of the city, but the inhabited new city was on the island out of his reach, so he built a causeway to the city, took the building material of the old tire, stones, pillars, even the dust of the city, and in seven months built a causeway over which his army marched right into the new city of Tyre. He destroyed the city, and from that day to this, it has never been rebuilt. Exactly what the Bible has said. Critics try to explain away the prophecy regarding Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of the city, saying, Ezekiel wrote it after it happened. <laughs> yeah, maybe so, if you think so. They couldn't possibly have anticipated what Alexander the Great did subsequently. There's three, about three centuries problem in there. So the ruins being excavated, there were all kinds of broken pieces of pottery and artifacts around. Ezekiel's prophecy was literally fulfilled. About 20 miles to the north, Sidon stands today as always has, but Tyre is gone. Nobody has tried to rebuild Tyre. Lebanon hasn't tried. God's Word says that Tyre will never be rebuilt. Anyone, anybody want to buy some real estate in Tyre? Verse 13. And I will cause the noise of thy songs to cease, and the sound of thy harp shall no more be heard. And I will make thee like the top of a rock, <laughs> indeed. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon, thou shalt be built no more. For I, the Lord, have spoken it, saith the Lord God. <laughs> I always picture Yul Brynner. So let it be written, so let it be done. Right. <laughs> anyway, from verses 15 through 18, the next group, we're going to see the focus of Ezekiel 
not on Tyre, but on the nations. The lament is for the nations which are affected by the fall of Tyre. A slight shift of focus here. Thus saith the Lord God to Tyre, shall not the isle shake at the sound of thy fall, when thy wounded cry and the slaughter is made in the midst of thee? There's a word here I want you to be alert to in the Hebrew. Translated here, the isle. Seems to make sense. I.e., it's a very simple little alpha and a yod. It's about as simple as you can get. E. Scholars are not sure what that really means. It means isle, a coast, or coastland, a shore. It's generally used of a distant, pleasant place. This is going to be important to us later in Ezekiel, to try to get a feeling for the connotation of that little word, isles, or its equivalent. Then all the princes of the sea shall come down from their thrones, and lay away their robes, and put off their broidered garments. They shall clothe themselves with trembling, they shall sit upon the ground, and they shall tremble at every moment, and be astonished at thee. Who is he talking about? Not the tyrants, the ones that were their customers. The ancient symbol of mourning for a king of a foreign land, when he was in mourning for the fall of another king, would be to come off his throne, put on different garments, and go through some kind of ceremonial mourning. That's what's being described here. It sounds strange to us, very well understood to people familiar with the ancient cultures. That the princesses shall come down from their thrones as a form of mourning the fall of the city. And they shall take up a lament for thee, and say unto thee, How art thou destroyed, that wast inhabited of seafaring men, the renowned city which was strong in the sea, she and her inhabitants, which caused their terror to be on all that haunt it. Wow. Now shall the isles tremble in the day of thy fall. Yea, the isles that are in the sea shall be troubled at thy departure. There's that word again. Again, the isles. We're going to be, we'll be pondering that when we get to chapter 39 of Ezekiel. Because there's a reference there that we're going to all take interest in. So from verse 15 to 18, the last four verses we've seen, we're in a strange Hebrew meter. It's actually a poetic meter here called the kina. It's a word that can mean dirge or like a funeral hymn, a kina. It's a particular meter in Hebrew poetry that suggests a lament or a funeral procession. That's the tone that is in the Hebrew meter that we obviously don't catch in the, in the, in the translation. For thus saith the Lord God, when I shall make thee a desolate city like the cities that are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep upon thee, and great waters shall cover thee. You know, it's interesting, it's God's style to speak denotatively of a local event, but in a more connotative sense. You know what I mean? I understand what I mean by that. Denotation, denotation is the precise meaning of the word. Connotation is the thought, the broader thoughts it evokes. Okay, the lamentation against Tyre, here's a literal city in the ancient world, but what is said about Tyre may have a much broader application. How about us? Is it possible that the sins of Tyre are not dissimilar from the sins of our own country, which is an island continent that has prospered economically from relationships all over the world? And we become proud, self-sufficient, and maybe self-deifying. That's scary. That parallel is disturbing. We'll see it come up here in a minute. We want to, as we study our Bible, to realize there is a consistent pattern throughout the Bible. And that's what I'll call the insanity of prosperity. There are other, other instances. Sennacherib, 2 Kings 17. Very powerful, very wealthy, got clobbered. Pharaoh of Egypt. He'll be alluded to here when we get another chapter or two. Nebuchadnezzar was in that mode in chapter 3 that leads to chapter 4 that Nebuchadnezzar wrote himself, explaining his fall through pride. And I believe it's his testimony, and I expect to see him when I get to heaven. Interesting chapter in the, chapter in the Bible written by Nebuchadnezzar himself. Herod in Acts 12. The man of sin is going to be guilty of the same thing, Paul warns us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. He will exalt himself above all that is called God. Incidentally, that also includes Allah. In Habakkuk 1, it, it, it really applies this to conquerors who rely on their weapons. 
we have a tendency to rely on the wrong things. And this even applies to those who worship the goddess of getting ahead. Those that make ambition the God before whom they kneel. And I won't ask for a show of hands. I suspect that many of us in this room have at least one time or another been very guilty of that very thing. Let's continue here in verse 20. God says, When I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit and with the people of old time and shall set thee in the low parts of the earth in places desolate of old with them that go down to the pit that thou be not inhabited and I shall set glory in the land of the living. I will make thee a terror and thou shalt be no more though thou be sought for. Yet shalt thou never be found again, saith the Lord God. Oh boy. Well, that sets the stage for chapter 27. There's a Latin phrase, Sic transit gloria mundi, which is really Latin for, thus passeth the glory of the world. One of the things we try, want to try to glean from these members is to get a feeling for the glory that was Tyre and understand that it too passed away. So the dirge over the merchant city that follows, the doom is worked out with a detail that reminds us it's so eloquent and so detailed, it almost reminds you of the Homeric catalog of ships and countries that we see in Homer's classics. Or It's without parallel in the history of literature. We'll take a look at that. And the other thing you're going to get a feeling for, it was almost as if Ezekiel had, at some time in his life, actually trod the streets of uh, Tyre and mingled with the crowd of the many nations and the costumes he met there. The cosmopolitan nature of Tyre is so evident in the passages that follow, you get the feeling that he must have experienced it face to face. I'm not saying he did, but he writes as if he did. And But apart from the poetic or prophetic interest, we're going to discover it's almost a catalog of geography and commerce of the old world. And we won't try to track them all down, we'll give you perspective as we go. But the key idea is that Tyre was the center of an empire, a commercial empire. Chapter 27, verse 1, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Now thou son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyrus, and say unto Tyrus, O thou that art situate at the entry of the sea, which art a merchant of the people for many isles. Thus saith the Lord God, O Tyrus, thou hast said, I am of perfect beauty. He said that of himself, in effect, that he was perfect. What brought Tyre down? I'm going to suggest that it was pride and the glory, the pomp, the prosperity. That has brought down many of the great nations of the world and reduced them to ruins. Now this chapter is going to give you a glimpse of how extensive the kingdom of Phoenicia was. It begins with Chittim or, or, or Cyprus, which is a word, by the way, which means copper. And that was one of the main things that they used to, to build their commerce and extends all the way to Tarshish, the word means a, a smelting plant or refinery. We'll get to that in a minute. Continuing, thy borders are in the midst of the seas, thy builders have perfected thy beauty. They have made all thy shipboards of fir trees of Sinar, and they have taken cedars from Lebanon to make masts for thee. Well, Sinar is the Amorite name for Mount Hermon, north of the Sea of Galilee, or Sea of Kinnereth as we think of it, uh, later named the Sea of Galilee. And the oaks of Bashan, and of course the cedars are le legendary of Lebanon, I don't go into that. And of the oaks of Bashan, Lebanon was known for their cedars, Bashan, or the Golan Heights, was known for their, for their oaks. The oaks of Bashan, have they made thine oars? The company of the Asherites have made the benches of ivory brought out of the isles of Chittim. So Bashan is east of the of Sea of Galilee, famous for its oak forests. The isles of Chittim, is that's a term for Cyprus, if you will, means copper, and that's one of the main commodities that they traded in. Tarshish was a refinery. Fine linen with embroidered, with embroidered work of Egypt was that which thou spreadest forth to be thy sail. Blue and purple from the Isles of Elisha was that which covered thee. The Isles of Elisha is unknown, although some scholars identify it as Elisha, which is the name of another name for Cyprus. Other suggestions is that Elisha was in Greece called by Homer Elysium, Italy or Syria. In any case, the dye industry is common throughout the Mediterranean. The inhabitants of Sidon and Arvad were thy mariners, O thy, o what, what, thy wise men, O Tyrus, that were in thee were thy pilots. 
Sidon, of course, is a seaport 20 miles north of Tyre, one of the oldest of the maritime powers. And Arvad is an island off the coast of Syria. Both cities were known for their shipping. The earliest Phoenician ships to get a feeling had, or, had like 50 oarsmen and were quite fast. But the big ships that were ocean-going were known as the ships of Tarshish. That term isn't necessarily geographic. It's a category of vessel, if you will. The ancients of Gibal and the wise men thereof were in the in thy caulkers, the ships of the sea with their mariners were in thee to occupy thy merchants. Now, Jabal is probably the Greek Byblos, or Jabal of today, about 21 miles north of Beirut on Syria's Mediterranean coast. And they're famous builders also, we find in 1 Kings and elsewhere. They of Persia and of Lud were in thine army, thy men of war, they hanged the helmet and uh, the shield and the helmet in thee, they set forth thy communists. They hung the sh shields typically in a, in a castle or on the side of a boat, that was their badge, if you will, of power. And Persia, is, this is the first mention of, in the Bible, by the way. Up till now it's called Elam, but this is a, it ultimately defeated the Babylonians sub, uh, subsequently. Lydia is on the west coast of Asia Minor, sometimes translated Lud. And foot maybe Cyrene or North Africa or Punt and Somaliland. Scholars debate the subtleties here. Both Lydia and foot were mercenary soldiers in the Egyptian army you find in Jeremiah. Now Persia, this name does not meet us in any Old Testament book before the exile. Elam takes its place up until the exile. And so this is the first mention of it as Persia. And it was just about this time that Ezekiel was, that the Persians were becoming conspicuous through their alliance with the Medes, and they ultimately, of course, conquer the Babylonians before the, before the death of, uh, of Daniel. In fact, he becomes the third ruler within the Persian Empire, interestingly enough. So here they're named as mercenaries for the Tyrian army. And the men of Arvad with thine army were upon the walls round about in the Gamadians, and they were in their towers, they hanged their shields upon thy walls round about, they have made thy beauty perfect. Arvad is possibly Helic in Cilicia, or Hethlon. Scholars debate the details. Gamadians is probably the community of the northern Syria, mentioned in their monoletters, uh, and there could be some others, but scholars have their different views trying to pin these down exactly. Tarshish is a, one, a term you'll find frequently in the Bible. Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kind of riches, with silver, iron, tin, and lead, and they traded in thy fairs. So Tarshish is a word we take. Britannia, by the way, is a word that means tin. The fact that Tarshish is associated as a source of tin is why many suspect that Tarshish was a label for Britain. The Phoenicians, we know, brought tin from Cornwall, England. Okay, It's very interesting that if you've studied Stonehenge archaeologically, you know that it was built over a 300-year period. It also has mathematical properties that allowed the priesthood that ran it to predict eclipses. So you can imagine the power of a priesthood that could predict eclipses. It's interesting, archaeologically, we know that it was abandoned after 300 years. We've also mathematically calculated that their system for predicting eclipses was perfect, except it made an error once every 300 years. And I always wonder what it must have been like for a priesthood that was established over several centuries, never missing, to have a day they blew it. <laughs> have no idea what happened. But we do know archaeologically from Stonehenge that it enjoyed worldwide commerce. They find artifacts there that, apparent, that have been traced to all over the world. So at the days of Stonehenge Prime, it was um, enjoyed worldwide commerce. Now, Jonah bought a ticket to Tarshish, but never saw it, of course. He saw the inside of a fish instead. The term ships of Tarshish doesn't necessarily mean the ships came from there. There was apparently a category, a vessel that was unusually large and designed for ocean travel. We find that the ships of Tarshish typically took three years to make a round trip. So that sounds, that's a lot bigger than just dealing with the Mediterranean. There's another term you find in the Bible I thought I'd just mention here too, the gold of Ophir. A lot of discussion, where is Ophir? Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold, we read in 1 Kings 22. It, Ophir is a region that was famous for its gold. That's all through the scripture. In the Septuagint, 
This word is transferred to Sophia, which is a Coptic name for India. So some people think from the, from the Septuagint that Ophir might have been in India. Josephus has identified it with Golden Chinese, which is really the Malay Peninsula. Now the Malay Peninsula is even further away, that way, right? Some suspect, but these are in the minority, but there's some scholars even suspect it might be, a, Ophir might be a reference to Central or South America. Where gold, of course, is legend. That's what drew Spain into all of that. Who knows? We'll move on. Yavon, Tubal, Meshech, they were thy merchants. They traded the persons of men and the vessels of brass in thy market. Yavon, of course, is the Ionians of Greeks. It's a, it's a synonym for our purposes of the Greeks of Asia Minor. Tubal and Meshech were principal cities in Anatolia, which today is the eastern two-thirds of Turkey. Meshech and Tubal we'll be talking a lot about when we get to Ezekiel 38. They of the house of Tagarma traded in thy fairs with horses and horsemen and mules. House of Tagarma, eastern Turkey and Armenia. The Armenians today call themselves Beth Tagarma, the house of Tagarma. They descended from Gomer in Genesis 10. And their mountainous region south of the Caucasus was celebrated for horses. So that all ties together. The men of Dedan were thy merchants. Many isles with, were the merchants of thy, merchandise of thy hand. They brought thee for a present horns of ivory and ebony. Of Dedan. Now here's, there's some manuscript problems here. The Masoretic text has Dedan, which is the way it's translated here. The Septuagint has Rodan, Rhodes. And the difference between the Daleth and the Resh is so subtle it could easily be a copyist error. And it's, it seems like this probably is Rhodes because Dedan is mentioned a couple of verses later, verse 20. So that argues in a sense that this may be a, a textual thing. No big deal for what it's worth. Syria was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of thy wares of thy making, the occupied in thy fairs with emeralds, purple embroidered work, and fine linen, and coral, and agate. And Aram, that's the word for Syria, and some manuscripts have Edom. It's a, it's a vile, vile pointing issue. Judah and the land of Israel, they were thy merchants. They traded in thy market wheat of Minnith and Panag and honey and oil and balm. Minnith and Panag are names of places in Israel that were famous for good wheat. And that's where Tyre apparently got its wheat. Minnith was formerly an Ammonite city in Judges 11. Panag is identified with, by Grotus, another scholar, as Phoenice, which is the Greek name for Canaan. And so these uh, have possible different views. Anyway, Damascus was thy merchant in the multitude of thy wares of thy making for the multitude of all riches and in the wine of Helbon and white wool. Wine of Helbon, 12 miles north of Damascus, was famed for its wine. The Persian monarchs would drink no other. So it was apparently pretty good wine. Dan, oh here's an interesting glimpse of something else. Dan also in Yavan, Yavan being the Greeks, going to and from, occupied in thy fairs, bright iron, Cassian, Calamus, and we're in thy market. Dan is here. What's Dan doing here? Most people have no idea what happened to the tribe of Dan. It became a seagoing tribe. It peeled off from Israel and became a seagoing tribe. There's a very strange prophecy in Deuteronomy by, in the Song of Moses. He shall leap from Bashan. Bashan being the Golan Heights. What's Dan doing up there? He was signed, he, he drew the lot of being west of, of um, Benjamin, and he inherited the Philistine country, couldn't handle it. We'll get into that. In fact, Deborah in the Dam of the Judges makes a criticism of him. Let's take a look at the tribe of Dan. It had the largest population. If you go into Numbers 1 and look at all the different tribes, Dan was, had one of the largest populations. And yet he drew the smallest allocation west of Benjamin. Boy, I bet you they were upset about that. While Samson was around, he was their hero. He did a lot of colorful pranks, but really didn't accomplish much. When he dies, the tribe couldn't handle the Philistines. They were too strong for them. So they send out a scouting party, and they discover a place up north at Laish that they just moved, took 600 of them and went up there and took over and moved up there. So they didn't stay where they were assigned. They went up north. Do you think that surprised God? It's interesting that long before they do that, in the days of Moses, when Moses prophesies on each of the tribes in Deuteronomy 32 called the Song of Moses, he makes a strange quote. He says they're going to leap from Bashan. And Josephus makes reference to this too. 
They were lost. They peeled off long before the Assyrian invasion. The Assyrians that came up took the northern things captive and distributed long before then. First Chronicles 1 to 8 has the genealogies of all the different tribes. You'll find, you look there, you won't find the tribe of Dan on the list. In Revelation 7, they're, they're one of the 12 that do not get sealed. They manage because they get land allocated in Ezekiel. We'll come to that when the time comes. Very strange prophecy by Moses. Deuteronomy 33, verse 22. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's wolf. He shall leap from Bashan. How would Moses know that Dan would abandon what he would ultimately be allocated and settle up north in what we would call the Golan Heights or what they would call Bashan? Moses, he's going to leap from Bashan. How did he do that? He, he apparently became friendly with the Phoenicians and learned how to be a seafaring tribe. When you get to the book of Judges and you get all the, con they're in there conquering the land, Deborah, after they fulfill their military thing, she goes through what they call the Song of Deborah, where she thanks the tribes that help and she scolds the tribes that didn't help. You've been listening to 6640, the ministry outreach of Koinonia House and Koinonia Institute. Today's Bible teacher was Chuck Missler, teaching through the book of Ezekiel. Download the new K-House TV app to access an ever-growing collection of free resources. Visit the Apple or Android App Store or search K-House TV on your Roku or Fire TV streaming device. Thank you for listening to 6640 and for your continued prayerful support of this ministry. Until next time, as we continue this series, may God bless you with the knowledge of His Son, Jesus Christ, as you study His Word.